live from the studios of WYES Television. The Metropolitan Crime Commission and Mass Communications present Louisiana Crackdown. It is a typical night in the emergency room at Charity Hospital. Wounded in a knife fight and high on drugs, this 34-year-old prostitute has abused her body with drugs so much, the staff is having a tough time finding a vein to administer medication. Are y'all killing me? Talk to people that have a switchblade and trying to attack somebody else, and in the meantime, caught her finger some kind of way. She says to raise the blade while she was trying to eat. So, I don't know what the story is. She doesn't verbally say anything. She does a history. She's got track marks on her arms. Um, apparently, she's been here a couple times with crack and cocaine use. That's all we know so far. Oh, down. Oh, my own Jesus. Oh, that's my own Jesus, my own. Well, the story was that he came, he'd been doing cocaine all night long, injecting it into his veins. He's got track marks on his arms, so they had difficulty starting an IV on him. And, um, had a big gunshot wound, and they said it was a shotgun because that's what the size of the wound in his arm was very large, and that was the entrance wound and the exit wound. Is, uh, there's an exit wound. He's got a, uh, I guess, a compound fracture. So they're going to take him up to surgery. You know why? Why the shooting occurred? He said he was doing cocaine all night long. I think he was just involved in some kind of altercation, and he lost. He was in jail and got out in October. Yes, he stayed in 18 months. What was he in jail for? Drugs. Selling drugs? Yes. Okay. How long has he been using, do you know? Mm, I really don't know that. It's, it's been a while, but I really don't know how long. I've talked with him and I've told him, uh, Dwight, what you're doing, you know, is wrong. And eventually, if you're going to get killed, son, why don't you stop? You know, I don't condone drugs. I had uh, eight children, and he's the only one that I know. You know, all the rest of my kids are they all right. They don't even smoke. You think this will stop him? I don't know, but I pray to God that something stops him before somebody kills him. Last night we had a guy who was from Sarasota, Florida, partying on Bourbon Street with his friends. He said he dropped acid, but he was, it was liquid for me, so it was probably PCP. So he came in and ranting and raving, asking for a petunia and all this kind of stuff, restrained. Then sat him in a room for two hours. He had a laceration to his chin and his lip. So two hours later, he's calm, didn't know what happened to him. Told him the story how he had jumped on the hood of a car in the, in the quarter. Policeman took him off the car, told him and give him one chance if he walk away. So the guy got down, walked away, 20 feet away. Then he started charging the cop. The cop hit him once in the mouth, checked himself. Recognize that between 86 and 89, the number of incidents of cocaine-related admissions jumped from 200 to almost 1,800. 86, 200, 89, 1,800. When one recognizes that many times these cases, when they present, also have some trauma associated with it, I'd say 75%. And one when one recognizes the fact that our capacity is limited, that every time we put a trauma case that's related to drugs in the OR, operating room, in the intensive care units, that a patient with a normal occasion for hospitalization who needs those services is denied those services. It causes backups in the emergency room. We've had occasions where We've had 10 to 15 patients waiting more than 24 hours because we didn't have a bed or didn't have an intensive care bed or we couldn't get into the operating room. And we're simply being bombarded 
by these cases that are drug related. This fellow's in room four twice. This is the second time in the year. He was shot in the thigh this time. He had multiple drugs that room. The abdomen last time, which a few people survived, but he did. And, and he comes back. You were in here before, weren't you? Yeah. Before then? This is the second time you've been shot? Yeah. Where were you shot the first time? No, thank you. Who shot? Who shot you then? Oh, my God. Why? Pierre LaFrance is a Surrey driver in the French Quarter and a victim of New Orleans' violent streets. Oh, I got robbed. I got shot. Robbed. I was beaten. I would say about a third of the people that are fourth that come in state that someone robbed them or jumped them to, to use their money and they're just happening to walk down the street or sit in a car. The trauma team fights to save the life of 14-year-old Dwayne Carter. According to police, Carter allegedly tried to rob a man at gunpoint. He received a bullet hole through the chest. These older people is pushing these young young people up to do their dirty work. And them youngsters going to get hurt from doing them older people work. Explain to me what you mean. What selling work? drugs, selling drugs, selling drugs. You think that's what your son was doing? I'm not going to say he wasn't, and I'm not going to say he's not. Like I say, I don't know what he's doing out here, and I'm not going to say he's the best child, because he's not. Because if he would have been, he wouldn't have been in the predicament he is not. Frederick Anthony Pooh is wanted by the Drug Enforcement Agency for conspiring to distribute more than one kilo of cocaine. Pooh is 46 years old and a native of Honduras. He is described as a white male, 5 feet 9 inches tall, weighing 160 pounds. He has brown eyes and brown hair. He also uses the alias Johnny Morales.
she has, in the last hour and a half, managed to come out of her restraints. And I had to call security again oh, to come back and restrain her for her own safety and for the safety of all the patients around her. We get a lot of this. We've got two other patients here right now that possibly are using drugs. We're not sure. They're so wild right now. We haven't evaluated them yet. They're very combative. They're tied down to stretchers. She's a little bit less wild than the other patients, so we were able to tie her to a wheelchair. Uh, the fact that New Orleans has been viewed as a party town or, or sort of sin city, if you will, has actually uh, been very detrimental to adolescents and children in the area because there has been sort of this easy attitude and easy access to alcohol and drugs. 56, 56 hits. 56 hits of LSD. He's got a lot of drugs over here. Uh-huh. Keep searching through the books. Don't let us catch him alive. There's something in here. Don't make us pass the place. Don't tell us where. I don't want no place. Don't let them get there. They're working. They're going to work through it. I mean, you know, and he's telling you, they find something. We find out he's lying. It's just going to get worse. But I'm not going to get out of here. You got some more? Yeah, look. Flush it down the toilet? Yeah. He got juice. He had a... Clipper juice in his bottle here. He flushed that down, and uh, some of the cigarettes he reached in and got part of it, but you can see there's a shovel left. Seven, three, four, five. What? Oh, One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's oh, you. What is yours? Yeah, that's what I got. Uh, thank you, yes, sir. Uh, how much money can you have in this time? Two, two, right? No problem. Two, no more. Two. Okay. Well, it's been nighttime. You don't know what's going on, so you're scared to come out here. How, what makes you afraid to come out? People getting mugged, pocketbook gets snatched, all that junk, man, you ain't coming out your house at night like that. So you're literally, huh? literally held captive in your own house, huh? That's right, that's right. What What do you think would solve the situation here? Clean it up, put better light on the thing. We see around here a lot of old broke cars, and anybody doing any kind of crime, that's what they're looking for, a dark spot. Abandoned buildings, junk that's cars. Right, that's right, that's right, that's right. You want your neighborhood back? We'd love to have it. Where we could sit out here and see from one end of the street to the other one. Anything covered around you, you know? Sure, we'd be glad to have it back. Right now I'm holding in my hand the Israeli-made Uzi 9mm submachine gun. It is, without a doubt, one of the most efficient killing machines ever encountered. It's the kind of machinery that our law enforcement officers are encountering each and every day lately in the war against drugs. Special agent in charge Pete Mastin is with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. And Pete, all of these weapons assembled here are just a small sample of the kinds of weapons your people are running into each and every day, correct? Not only our people, Warren, but the police. They're running into these types of weapons because they're the stock and trade of the narcotics dealer and the violent criminal on the streets of this country and of New Orleans. And these are not the civilian versions of these weapons. They've all been modified to fire fully automatic, correct? That's, that's correct. They're all illegal weapons unless they're registered. Thanks, Warren. The cocaine problem, where does the blame lie? While the majority of the coca plants are grown in Peru and Bolivia, the mafia, or cartel as it's called, is in Colombia, and it's responsible for manufacturing and distributing cocaine. Colombians blame the United States for the cocaine problem, saying we have too many drug addicts here in the U.S. Many in our country, though, blame the Colombian government for not being able to control the powerful drug lords. Recently, the Louisiana Crackdown production team, led by producer Tom Steyer, visited Columbia and found it to be a country under siege.
The quiet simplicity of Colombia's countryside, the home of the mythical Juan Valdez who sells coffee, contrasts dramatically with the country's sprawling capital city of Bogota. of Colombia are under siege by the cartel. Several years ago, the United States officially declared a war against illegal drugs, particularly the cocaine that is processed in and distributed from Colombia. But many Colombians openly say the U.S. is only paying lip service to that declaration and accuse us of doing little to lower demand in the United States. And for us, this is a real war. It's not a, it's not a verbal or rhetorical war. And um, the very frustrating part is that um, all this blood that is spilled, all this heroism, all, this, uh, all these casualties are, might be useless because it's a war that ultimately uh, does not depend on us. It's a war that transcends our borders. It's a war where the, where the real issue and the real origin is in the United States. It's in the, the North American demand for drugs. Indeed, the money raked in from the United States by the various drug cartels have given them power almost beyond belief. Until just recently, the drug barons lived openly in opulent splendor. <laughs> What sent the drug barons into hiding and what they fear the most is extradition to the United States for trial. But so far, only Carlos Later has been extradited, tried, and convicted. Now the cartel has literally declared war on the Colombian justice system. It's an effort to get the extradition treaty nullified. This war for us right now is, is, is not even a war against narco-trafficking, it's a war against uh, narco-terrorism. This war we're waging is not to, to solve the problems of drug consumption in the United States. It's become a, it's become a war to, to save our institutions, our democratic institutions, uh, the administration, administration of justice, which has been practically liquidated by, 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 the, by the drug barons, the freedom of the press, which is threatened every day, the assassination of, ju of uh, journalists, the bombing of newspapers. Um, well, uh, this, this drug uh, problem has become... Um, uh, to the preservation of 150 years of democracy in Colombia and of, of democratic institutions. Is the cocaine war in Colombia winnable? Most American officials I talked with, off the record, likened it to Vietnam. For example, the U.S. recently gave Colombia more than $60 million in aid. The narcotics police received about 15%. The rest went to the military. But ironically, the narcotic police do 90% of the anti-drug work. The DEA attache, who requested his identity be kept secret, explained his understanding of that split. Another reason that explains why more uh, went to the military than to the police is the fact that uh, uh, under the, uh, the, share, uh, the law which the sharing took place, uh, uh, it's very specific that the equipment has to come from uh, military stockpiles. Uh, the equipment available in military stockpiles uh, do, do not necessarily assist a police effort. Uh, so the needs of the police are very different from the needs of the military. And consequently, uh, you know, there was a disparity there. Santos believes shutting down the cartel in Colombia is not the answer. The Colombian state and the army and the police make it impossible for the drug traffickers to work and live here. Well, go to Peru, go to Bolivia, to go to Brazil. 
The attaché would like to see more commitment for law enforcement. But he also believes for this war to be won, the American people must become more involved. The bottom line, I think, uh, lies on, on somehow getting the public uh, to accept the responsibility. And when I say the public, I don't mean just a percentage of the public. I'm talking about the majority of the people accepting a responsibility for the problem. These Colombian men are smoking a drug called bazooko. It is made from the cocoa paste that is shipped in from the cocoa producing countries. The paste is dried and powdered and then smoked with tobacco. The cartel had originally planned to enter this drug on the U.S. market, but that was before crack. In Bogota, bazooko is a drug of choice. These men claim they're not addicted, but Raphael spends half of his salary on it. Perhaps the most elaborate cocaine smuggling scheme discovered to date was made by U.S. Customs this past summer. An underground tunnel between the U.S.-Mexican border. Its estimated cost one and a half million dollars. But officials believe the smugglers made back their investment in just one load. And it is estimated the tunnel may have been in operation six months before it was discovered. On the Mexican side, the smugglers' home took on the eerie feeling of something out of a James Bond movie. The recreation floor opened to reveal the tunnel in a five-ton storage room below. A customs drug dog hit on what appeared to be an empty tractor-trailer truck coming into the United States from Guatemala. Agents spent hours getting to the concealed dope. Finally, the payoff. Like a slot machine, the steel containers poured out 450 kilos of cocaine. An aging seaplane lands somewhere in the desert. But this time, the bad guys found they'd been set up by U.S. Customs. Stopping the smuggler at sea is now one of the Coast Guard's primary missions. It is a never-ending vigil. All man-sized compartments. And uh, if you could, just uh, so we'll start at the bow, top, and go down. This never-seen-before tape reveals how the men from the Coast Guard Cutter Cushing felt last October when they made the largest seizure of cocaine ever at sea. Tending to be drug couriers, the local DEA office convinced smugglers from Guatemala to let them haul more than 900 kilos of cocaine to New Orleans. This is the original bag. This bag has 23 kilos in it. The undercover operation started last April and resulted in the seizure of coke and $405,000 in cash. Surveillance netted the arrest of eight individuals, including this Colombian, Jorge Rolando Castillo Garcia. Okay. So they got 15,000 in tens, 60,000 in 20, 20,000 in uh, hundreds, uh, and, uh, and Another important agency casting the legal net over smugglers is the Internal Revenue Service. You see, smugglers need some way to launder huge sums of cash. Recently arrested here in New Orleans, Benny Corello, who was allegedly trying to convert drug money into legal cash. The IRS says most drug dealers are too greedy for their own good. If I was a drug dealer and I had fives, tens, and twenties, I had several hundred thousand dollars. 
um, why can't I just go out here and buy my $100,000 sailboat? Because the guy is supposed to report a $10,000 above cash transaction. Is that right? That's, that's correct. That's one reason the uh, individual you buy your uh, boat from is required to report it. But another reason is they know that the appearance of these assets stick to them. You know, what's IRS going to think? We're going to see the person with a $100,000 boat living in a $500,000 house and not filing a tax return or only reporting $10,000. That's going to draw the attention of IRS. What they want to do is get that money in a form that appears to be non-taxable. That's their ultimate objective. So they don't even want to pay taxes. Except for the guy that wants to, let's say I, got a, I have a car wash. And, you know, there's no way of counting how many cars will I go through, and every month I add $10,000 to the kitty. But, I, but I'm going to end up paying taxes on that if I report it, right? Absolutely. You'll pay taxes on it. And Some of these guys are so cheap, they want to get away with not having to pay the taxes. Well, most of them are that cheap. I mean, you know, they're into trafficking because they're greedy people. They do not intend to pay any taxes uh, to anybody for anything. And these same people, by the way, uh, are quick to demand government services. 20-year-old Aaron Brown is wanted by the New Orleans Police Department for distributing cocaine. He is described as a black male, 5 feet 11 inches tall. He weighs approximately 145 pounds. His eyes are brown and his hair is black. He has two gold teeth. I got a shooter. I got a shooter right here. You know if he's there. I went through the trouble. Back. If these were big, I'd say yeah. Y'all ain't police, huh? Are you the police? We've been back here before. All right, man. Don't twenty. They live today, Jack. You some big ones? Yes, sir. Hey, you want? I tell you what to do. You see that? How big you got? That's all you got, man. Yeah, man. Look at that. That's it, though, man. I have fire. You know what's up? Big one, man. One dude you're going to deal with, bro. Ain't that, no will about here. One man, dude you're going to deal with. Man, y'all get on. I'm That's taking care strange. of this man, man. Hey. I'm That's taking care of Give me the one, bro. I'll get you rocks. No, man. Give me the rocks. Okay, okay, I'll bring the rocks to you. Okay, I'll bring them to you. I'm bigger than this. At times, dealers become very competitive. Right, let me do this. Come on. Come on, man. Big, bro. Y'all want it? Y'all want it? Hey, come over here. Let me do that for you. Hey, come in the hole. Come in the hole. I got knives and way better than that. Over there, just fly right over there. Some will try to rip you off. Look, you know, he said he put six rocks in my hand. Four, man. That, yeah, how many rocks you put in my hand? No. Bro, come on, man. Give me my rocks, bro. Ain't no way to do no business. Others ask for a kickback. Hey, y'all would give me a piece, man. Yeah, you all the same. Give me a piece. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, I just can't tell you how man. You owe me right, man. You owe me 10 more dollars. Meet Louise. She's on her way to becoming a television star. Rock or coin back, coin back. All right, come on, come on. Take your pick. Take your pick. I'm the girl. That's it? You want another one? You got any powder? No powder. The crackdown production team was with the sheriff's department when Louise was arrested.
just stay high now if I told you that. I guess not. What? I figured you stay high now if I told what? you that. I do what I want. High for what? Okay, girl. We'll show you the tapes. I'm going to show you the tapes. Ricky also ended up in the Crackdown video library, but at least he has a sense of humor about being busted. I ain't shot nothing since this morning, shit. But I gotta lie to you. How long have you been shooting? All my life, bro. 17 years old when I started shooting, okay? All right? 36. 36. Yeah. What kind of charge they got? No, I don't like cocaine. I like heroin. That's what I like to shoot. Okay? Is that nice? You know? I mean, I shoot a little cocaine. There's a lot more. 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 The questionnaire gives researchers general information about the arrestee, like age, occupation, education, and so on. After the preliminaries, the real information gathering begins. You were shot mushrooms, black tar heroin, crack, rock kind, cocaine powder. This 29-year-old has been a crack addict for four years. After the questionnaire, she talked about life on crack. I can't, can't do it out. How do you get money for it? Prostitute. Were you prostitute before you started using drugs? No. I never, I never had a, I never had a jail record in my life. How'd you get started on the drugs? Um, a man brought it into my home. And, uh, started selling it in my home and I was doing it occasionally and then I got hooked on it. When he tried to leave, I found it and I couldn't do it out. You had to turn to the streets? Yeah. Things got worse and worse. How? I didn't want to go to work. Then I lost my job. Um, then um, I found that I had to go. In order for me to get it, I had to go to the prostitution. So I started that. Now, you know, I couldn't keep up a home or anything on the kind of addiction I had. Have you ever tried alcohol? Yes, ma'am, I do drink. Regular cigarettes? Yes, ma'am, I do drink. Marijuana? I tried marijuana, so. You ever inhale glue again? According to officials, the New Orleans Duff survey indicates drug use may be leveling off. But don't start cheering yet. You have to realize it's a leveling off at a high level. Uh, we're talking about still around 50% of the people arrested test positive for cocaine, which usually means that they've used the drug within the last two or three days. There's still a lot of people are testing positive for cocaine. Uh, you're running about 30%, 30 to 40%, depending on the time period you're talking about, testing positive for marijuana. Uh, you still got a lot of serious drug use amongst the arrested population. In a lifetime, how many times did you say you've injected drugs? <laughs> That's a real good question. I, it, hundreds of times. Hundreds of times. When you find high levels of drug use, illicit drug use, as we, we find in New Orleans and in other cities, it basically gives us a way to intervene in the problem. That is, it says, here is the high-risk group. If we want to make a difference in drug use in New Orleans, where we should focus our resources, a lot of our resources, is on the people who are being arrested every day, because that's where we find these tremendous levels of drug use. And so oftentimes what that tells a city is, um, it, it raises the question for a city as to what are we then doing with these people who are being arrested and who are using drugs. Now you have to remember that these aren't people who are primarily arrested and charged with a drug offense. The majority of the people we're talking about are charged with serious non-drug offenses. A friend of mine was doing it and asked me that I want to try it. And I said no, but after a while watching them do it, and just got curious, you know, what it was. So I um, started trying it. Something actively is introduced, the program is actively introduced to intervene with this population. They merely slip through the doors of the, uh, actually the revolving doors of the criminal justice system and they're back out on the street and into their drug abuse lifestyles very quickly. Started drinking wine and stuff, smoking weed, you know, smoking weed and stuff, you know. And, uh, I'm 20 years old, I've been in our jail since, like I said, 13. And then we're sort of amazed to find 
uh, courts are overwhelmed with cases. Well, the, one of the reasons is that, for the most part, we don't generally pay much attention or enough attention to intervening in the drug problem and these people who are arresting. So the idea is that I think the DUF data can be used to show that law enforcement in the United States is arresting the right people. That is, we're getting the, the most dysfunctional drug abusers in the country. And what we want to make sure in New Orleans and in other cities is that we don't lose the opportunity that this represents for intervening in the demand for drugs that, re that this population represents. I was walking down the block with a friend of mine, you know, guy just come up to him, you know, thank the Lord, he didn't want to do me nothing. He took and just popped the guy in the face, pow, blood went all over me. I freaked out. I just stood there, I couldn't move. Then I heard the sirens and I walked on off. The National Duff Director believes to solve our drug problem, we must treat those who are arrested. We have a tremendous it's not a very popular idea among most. That the majority of the people who process through the criminal justice system are put on probation or are released right after arrest. So there's a, it's not just people in prison. It's the fact that we arrest them and then release them back into the community very quickly. Now the cost of doing that without intervening in their drug problem is the continual crime and rearrest, recidivism, and re recirculating them through the court system. So people tend to focus on the cost of adding urine surveillance, the cost of adding treatment. And what I suggest that we, we look at is the cost of not doing that. The cost of not having these programs is the overwhelming crime problem and the overburdened criminal justice system that exists, exists in the country today. Jean St. Pierre and Mary Alice St. Pierre are fugitives from the federal government. Both are charged with distributing ecstasy. Jean is described as a white male, 5 feet 10 inches tall, weighing 150 pounds. He has brown hair and brown eyes. Mary Alice is described as a white female, 5 foot 5, weighing 115 pounds, with blonde hair and brown eyes. Mary Alice also goes by the name of Mary Alice Prater. And Jean has also used the aliases J. St. Pierre and the Captain. Say New Orleans to anyone who doesn't live here, and they will most likely think of the French Quarter, particularly Bourbon Street. Music is one of the strongest draws. also find music on the streets. Here is an anti-drug rap song. The laissez-faire attitude towards sex and booze creates an atmosphere of almost anything goes, including the sale of illegal drugs to tourists. This young man first offered to find me a prostitute, but then offered to find me crack cocaine. I thought you would, I got some rocks and some powder. Bring it down here. I got this here right up here. It's got a it right over there. How do I know you're going to murder me if I go down here? No. Say, Bob, it's on bourbon. You see where that corner where all them people's at? Say, buy an out here from the bush. Say, look at me. Well, look at our No, man, I got to. I just bring it down here to me. I got to say it right now. All you got to do is walk and stand by that Chinese. Go wait. Go wait in the Chinese place. I worked on one of the ships. I just came in the other day. What? No, man, I got to stay here. Huh? I said, I got to stay here. You're going to bring it to me. I got it right here. It's on the bed. What'd you do? I'll tell you. Put it through right here. To the police? Right here, right here, right here. Let me see. There's two pieces in there. I'm not about to get caught feeling. Let me see. Get feeling. Police right there. Come on. Come Put it up. Be right there. Put it right. in the pot. See you later. Ironically, four police officers on horseback passed by as we completed the sale. Within minutes, a second dealer hit me. Well, what, what you got to offer? What I could have got you a $50 hand, man, for that around the real shit. You could have smoked the money. Yeah. I tried it, you know? Yeah. Then a third started arguing with the second. I'm serious, bro. 
Sale of powdered cocaine. I don't know it's really coke. Oh, I don't know it's really coke. You tell you what, man. Police are going to go for the field. You're going to buy it off the Footnote to that tape, producer Tom Steyer says all of the drugs that he purchased on Bourbon Street that night were tested, and all of them were bunk. And that's what it's known as on, on the streets. That means fake drugs, and that's what leads to the kind of violence we're seeing here in New Orleans. When it comes to drugs and violence, what kind of image is New Orleans projecting? What is it doing to our tourism industry? Again, that's one of the questions we'll be discussing in our town hall meeting beginning at 9 p.m. Ted N. Dawson was born September 27, 1960, and is wanted for the distribution of a dangerous controlled substance. Dawson, a former city security officer, is described as a black male, 5 foot 9 inches, weighing approximately 200 pounds. He has black hair, brown eyes. Numerous tattoos cover his arms, among them the words bulldog and glasses. Also the letter T and the letter D. Earlier tonight, we took you to Charity Hospital for a close look at the human toll in the drug war. You saw the overdoses, the gunshot wounds, but the suffering isn't limited to the emergency room. Sometimes the victims are the smallest, most innocent of all human beings. At Charity Hospital alone, officials estimate 500 babies a year are born addicted to cocaine. Some die. Others stay in the hospital for months. Doctors feel their chances of survival would increase if their mothers would just get prenatal care. A high percentage of the babies who have problems, who end up not being able to stay in the newborn nursery, but having to go into the intermediate care nursery or the intensive care nursery, have no prenatal care. And so well over 50% of the babies requiring that kind of extra nursery care have no prenatal care by their mothers. And that's the disturbing group, the group that causes the most problems for the hospital as well as for the babies themselves to be able to get through that newborn period. This baby is now seven days old, and she was born to a 17-year-old mother whose urine is positive for cocaine. And the baby actually was born by emergency cesarean section because mom came in with a tender uterus, evidence of a, of a separation of the placenta, the abruptio placenta that we talked about previously, in which the, one of the effects is the vasoconstrictive effects of cocaine on the vessels, not only within the baby, but in the placenta itself. And if that happens, the, the placenta can separate prematurely. It is life-threatening to the baby, and either the baby then dies inside or has to be delivered by emergency cesarean section to be able to live. And uh, it, it, we have to take the baby as it is, and this one was only about 26 weeks gestation, meaning it was 14 weeks early when this occurred. And therefore, we have a baby now that only weighs one pound, seven and a half ounces at birth, and they all lose weight. This baby now only weighs one pound, three and a half ounces at seven days of age. And now we'll start the weight gain phenomenon. This baby will expect to be in the nursery somewhere between 90 to 120 days. The hospital bill for this baby will be in the range of $150,000 or more, depending on the number of complications that she has. All too often, this is a common story. Now, it sounds contradictory, but many pregnant addicts avoid prenatal care because they fear something is wrong with their baby. Were you using during your pregnancy? Yes, I was. How did that make you feel? Depressed. <laughs> used to make the baby kick all around in my stomach. Yeah. Like she would 
when I hit, she hit. At first, that was in the local culture as the baby was enjoying the, the hit as well. The baby may not be getting enough oxygen from the placenta to the mother, and he may be moving, and we feel very strongly that that's what's going on. He's moving and thrashing around because he's hypoxemic. Neither of the crack-addicted mothers interviewed for this story sought prenatal care, yet both got help for their addictions after their babies were born. It's a, a devastating thing to have to go through, you know, to be able to, you know, after you have your baby, and you turn over and you look, look at the doctors working on your baby, and you say, wow, you know, what, what has happened to me? You know, what's going on? And it, it scares you. It brings on that scare, you know. Am I at fault? Am I really at fault? It make you think, you know, that's the life there. She was a premature baby, one pound, ten ounces, yeah. She's still in the hospital. How long has that been? She's, she's four months now. She's been in the hospital since she was born. She's five, and a, five pounds, five and a half ounces now, yeah. What has she been through? Oh, she, she had surgery a couple of weeks ago. She came out of the surgery on top, you know. She had a relapse a week ago where they had to go back in and do it all over again because it didn't heal right, you know, and she's coming along okay now, yeah. Yeah, she's going to be all right, you know. We do not take babies away from mothers just for the fact that they, uh, just because they may have used drugs. We want mothers and babies, well, pregnant women to come into the clinic because the outcome is always better for the mother and the baby if they have prenatal care. And regarding prenatal care, the more the better. You mothers that are out there and y'all pregnant, please find some help. Seek some help, you know, for the baby, you know. If not for yourself, for the baby, you know, please. Good advice coming from someone who definitely knows these have to be the most tragic of all victims of this horrible drug scourge that is in New Orleans at this point. Peggy is standing by and we felt like this would generate a lot of calls to the helpline and apparently it has. Peggy? Thank you, Andre. And yes, we have Vic here, who is a helpline counselor. And Vic, you got a call that relates directly to what we've been talking about, the plight of the children. Yes, indeed. A lady called from Kenner, Louisiana, about her next-door neighbor and very close friend, who, as we speak, the lady has a one-month-old baby, and she's out on the street looking for crack now. The baby was born addicted to crack. The, uh, the uh, mother's been on crack for several years. Uh, in addition to the small baby, she has two uh, very small children at home right now, alone by themselves, while the uh, mother is out on the street searching for crack. This neighbor was, was frantic. She's known of the situation for some time and had no idea of how to, how to handle it. What I suggested that she, uh, that she do, um, since she doesn't know the location of the woman, has no idea where she is, uh, does expect her to, uh, to return home once she scores. Um, I suggested that she call the Jefferson Parish Coroner's Office, explain the situation to them, and they will issue an order of protective custody and uh, have the lady brought in for treatment. Okay, Vic, thanks very much. And if you do need more information, please call our helpline. And now back to Warren. Thank you, Peggy. You know, all too often our young people, it doesn't matter whether they're black or white, Hispanic or Oriental, who experiment with drugs pay a crucial price. They become addicted. But why do our kids take these risks? Next, a group of teenagers, all of them going through drug and alcohol rehab at Joe Ellen Smith Psychiatric Hospital, try to explain exactly why they risked it all. I started drinking, I was 10. And, but, and I started getting into the beer. Then I got to the hard, hard liquor. What are all the drugs that you've tried them? Alcohol, weed, speed acid and, and then they got the freon and all oh you did some huffing yeah some inhalants and you got the liquid paper mm -hmm. and scotch guard i mean it was just like it's when you didn't have no drugs you can get under and you go under the medicine cabinet or like get the nyquil or some 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 medicine or like anything I've always had a problem with fitting in with people I've always been different and uh, I found drugs and the people who use drugs if you use drugs I mean they're like hey come on buddy yeah you got the drugs yeah you know and I 
started dealing for that kind of stuff, you know. I wasn't really doing it for the money. I mean, I barely made money off of it. I started, like, little by little, you know. I was about seven, and I, I would, my dad would say, here, you want to try this beer, you know, and stuff. And I, and I would taste it, and I really didn't like beer. I, I never have really, you know, acquired the taste for beer. And, and so, like, when I was 11 years old, I started drinking really hard liquor. I never started off with the slow stuff, you know. And, um... I guess since I was 11 years old, I've been drinking, you know, the whole time. Um, hard stuff, really hard stuff. To this age, you know, 15. Just whatever I could get my hands on, I would drink. Um, the drugs I tried were ecstasy, acid, um, speed, pot, and, you know, I, I, I dealt stuff like that too. And I agree with Billy about when he said, you just want to fit in, you know, you want to be the person and it's like when I drank I, I I felt that power you know I mean I always wanted to be the most popular person in school I always wanted to be the most prettiest girl you know and all that stuff and I mean when I drank I felt so powerful you know like I was that popular girl that pretty girl and everything I mean a lot of people tell me oh, I would have never guessed that you have a problem with alcohol you don't seem like the type of girl who drinks and maybe it's those people that don't seem like the type who actually do it. I, I don't know. I mean, it's just really hard for me to cope with this right now. And I'm having my withdrawal symptoms, and I don't know how to deal with that and all the pain I'm feeling. There's nothing to cover up the pain, you know, nothing to numb it. And it's just really hard, and I'm scared to death. And I'm scared to go back out there, you know, and face all these problems. And I just need support from, you know, everybody. Everybody that I can get support from. I mean, because this is really hard. Started about, I really started about, I guess it was about 12. I remember because it was like wine coolers and my brother went and bought for me some wine coolers, a few six packs. And I never, I was, I never thought I would start. I was always too smart to start something like that. I was just stupid. I would never start drinking. It kills your brain cells and all of this because I was really smart. So, but everybody else did it, so I said, it must not be that bad if everybody else doesn't. I just didn't care. You didn't, didn't care what thought? I just didn't care about anything. My grades went down. I just didn't really want to do anything. I just, self-esteem was like bottom. I didn't think nothing about myself. I feel guilty about just letting it get control of me and just winding up in here, but it's really not my fault. It's a disease. Alcoholism is a disease. It's kind of hard to admit you want to say that. You know, if I wanted to stop, I should have stopped. But it just it messes with your head and says, hey, everything's all right, so you don't have to change anything. So it's a powerful disease. What does it mean for a 15-year-old to have their world fall apart? It's hell. Yeah, it's living hell. It's, it's just so, it's hard to go through this. I mean, you know, you feel like you've lived your life and there's nothing else for you to do. I mean, you feel like you've done everything. It's really hard to just go back to being a kid, you know. I never had the chance to go out and play with kids my age and have fun, you know, playing Barbie dolls and stuff like that. I never got to do that. And, I mean, it may sound funny, but you know, that's some things that, you know, I miss. I miss my mom tucking me in at night and stuff like that and saying prayers together. And it's just... You miss out on all that stuff because you have to grow up so fast, it seems, you know, and it's hard to deal with. So then you turn your problems to something else that seems a little bit easier, drugs and alcohol. And now we come in for treatment and we have to accept our responsibility as going back out there and being a, a human being, you know, and we're going to make mistakes, you know, just hopefully they won't be drugs and alcohol and accept that. It takes this place to jump start your family to realizing what your problems are. I tried to reach out and in my home and I tried to get attention and they didn't listen to me and now I'm in treatment and they have to listen. I don't know how to yeah, express all so bad when I came in here and I let my family now and my friends because I'm like they didn't know I had all these problems I was supposed to have. I was supposed to be so successful when I grew up and it's like I had everything together but they didn't know that and I was an alcoholic and I hid it from them because I didn't want to stop. I have a lot of guilt. 
I still know how to make a mess with the people that I've hurt. So I've used a lot of friends. Well, I don't know if they know it, but I know it. Like I would steal from them, I'd steal from my parents. Why don't you just let it run its course and just let these people get over it, you know what I mean? Say, hey, I'm sorry, that's the best I can do, you get over it. Is that enough? No. I mean, your parents will get over it eventually, they love you, so eventually they'll get over it, right? I guess. Isn't that enough? No, I still have that same guilt feeling in me. What's the future for you guys as far as drugs go? All you have to do is stay sober today. Stay straight today. That's how you have to think. You can't just say, I'm never going to use again. You should say, today, I'm not going to use, you know? Let's keep it's it simple. Day by day. One day at a time. It's a process. Gilda Green is considered by federal agents to be armed and dangerous. She is wanted for the distribution of cocaine. Born in 1961, she is 5 feet 1 inches tall, 130 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. She has two tattoos. On the left leg, the letter G, and on the right leg, the letter C. Gilda has a long history of felony arrest. Remember, federal authorities consider her armed and extremely dangerous. Again, one of the objectives tonight is to get the drug dealers off the street. And a tremendous number of you out there are letting us know that's what you want to do. You've been calling our tip line. Let's check in with Joan Malter now to see what kinds of calls we're getting. Joan? Lynn, we're here with John Evans, who's with the Narcotics Division of NOPD, telling us that you're getting calls from a lot of street dealers. We're getting a lot of calls. Unfortunately, we're not getting enough detailed information where we can take action right now. We're prepared to take action. If there's someone on the corner or someone in the neighborhood that's active right now, this is what we're looking for. Physical description, clothing description, vehicles, or the exact location of the individual, and if they can observe where the stash is, where the stash is located. And that's basically what we're looking for. Um, are you getting a, a considerable volume of calls? Tremendous amount of calls. It's not unexpected, but we are very satisfied with the amount of calls we're getting. Thank you. Andre? Joan, to make strides in the war on drugs, addicts must be able to get help, regardless of their social standing. Warren, imagine this frustrating scenario. Someone's addicted, they want help, but they don't have insurance. Where do they go? Andre, that's a problem that occurs each and every day in our community these days. There are thousands, literally thousands of drug addicts out there who don't have the money or the insurance coverage, but who still would like to get off drugs. Now, there are a few places in our city that can help, but certainly not enough based on the long waiting lists at each of those centers. The Odyssey House offers long-term treatment for alcohol and drug abusers. An on-site upholstery shop prepares residents with job skills and generates some money for the facility. We're a 14 month program. The residents here run the program themselves. And that's one of the unique things about our program is that the residents actually treat one another themselves. And the staff is just here to make sure that residents are following treatment plans and basically doing what they should be doing. Before I came to Odyssey, I had been using drugs and alcohol for 14 years. 14 years of hell. The last five years it got really, really bad for me because I was out there on the streets basically. I was an embarrassment to my family. I have three kids that I totally neglected and um, I sold my body. I did anything I had to do to get the drugs, you know. And you know, like something just like slapped me in my face, you know. My child coming to me telling me she's getting ready to graduate from high school. And here I've been drinking and drugging for 14 years and, you know, it's like a, a, a mountain came down on top of my head, you know. Where did those 14 years go? I just wanted to be numb because I didn't, at that point, I didn't know how to face things or face situations. I didn't know how to work through anything, you know, so the best, best thing for me to do was to medicate it. But in here I had a chance to learn how to work through these situations. I learned how to accept me and that I wasn't such a bad person after all. What all we're seeing now is cocaine. People who are either 
mainlining cocaine or freebasing it. For the majority of it are people who are freebasing. Used to be, uh, at one time, we were seeing a lot of heroin addicts, okay, uh, IV users. Then it got to the point where we were seeing um, a lot of people using PCP. Uh, now it's uh, strictly cocaine. I just was like addicted person, just had to have it and always wanted it. I mean, to be like, I can go to sleep, I sometimes just be dreaming about it, can't sleep. I wake up in the morning, same thing, it just stayed on my mind. I always had to have it. I know that I was out there doing wrong, but it was like I didn't have no control over it. I mean, I get out of jail and I, I go square for a week or two or three, probably a month. And then, I mean, it's just um, one little taste of it, you know, one little hit, and um, it just sends me off, and I'll be right back where I started from. As long as there's life, there's hope. How old were you when you started smoking? 16. The sentiment heard throughout the city that cocaine is the number one drug problem is echoed at the New Orleans Substance Abuse Clinic. Uh, cocaine now is about 40, well over 40 percent of our admissions are for cocaine. Previously alcohol was the, the major problem and actually I guess we, we have to say alcohol is still the number one drug problem both in this city and, and I guess the whole country. But before uh, the admissions for drug here, drugs here were less than 30 percent. All the drugs the total of all the drugs were less than 30% of our clientele. I think the drug problem has gotten a jump on us. And it's, so far, it's gotten so far ahead that, uh, that even though we're, we are moving now, definitely we're moving to solve the problem. And there's more money coming in uh, to solve the problem. Uh, still, we're going to see this, this lag in, in getting the services there when the need is so great. I think everyone would say right off the top that medical detoxification is one of the major needs. Uh, we do have some non-medical detox beds available, but we have uh, very little capacity right now in the city of New Orleans or in Region 1 uh, for, for someone who is in serious medical difficulty because of drugs. Of course, the, uh, the medical wards at Charity Hospital will accept people for those problems, but then they have to compete for, uh, for admission along with people with other medical problems. And then they... Uh, the, the medical staff at Charity has to decide who's in worse condition. And so naturally someone with a heart attack uh, or with a gunshot wound is going to get uh, a bed before someone who needs detoxification. It's great to see evidence of young people trying to turn their lives around and some of the success stories already taking place at some of our drug treatment facilities in the New Orleans area. But it's also frustrating when you realize that there are so many more people looking for this type help who can't afford it themselves and don't really have that many places to turn. That's one of the reasons part of this Louisiana Crackdown Project includes our special helpline. Peggy Scott Laborde is there and Peggy, hopefully we're getting more calls from people looking for help, right? Oh yes indeed, Warren. We've already received 300 and there are plenty more coming in right now. A reminder that the helpline does not end after this program. We have our volunteers and our counselors here um, till midnight and also tomorrow and Friday from 9 to 5, so all day in those days. So the help does continue. Where there is life is hope is certainly an inspirational message and a realistic one. We can try to help you get towards a solution. Whether it's a family member or relative, we'd like to hear from you. And now, back to Lynn. Thank you, Peggy. You know, Bridge House is one of those places that offers care for indigent alcoholics and drug addicts. While they can only treat about 350 people a year, they're forced to turn away more than a thousand seeking help. The problem is not enough money, and that translates into too few beds. We are on the average turn away four or five people a day. We just don't have the room for them. We don't have the money, time, or facilities to take care of those amount of people. We do the best we can. We have a day program, which a lot of them attend. Uh, but then that means we have to find them alternate places to live, and those are very limited. So it, it, it's a growing problem, and uh, um, it's just going to continue to get worse unless some strict measures are taken to help. We take people with, who have absolutely nothing. We have people who come to our doors with no clothes, no shoes, no family support left, no jobs, no money, no nothing. 
And we take them in, clothe them, feed them, and get them into treatment. Cocaine, crack cocaine, we have some speed freaks here. You know, we have the regular mill, run-of-the-mill drugs still around. Heroin's not going away. Marijuana's not going away. The pill factories are still pushing pills on the street. You know, we have ecstasy, and uh, now they got some things called ice and some all kinds of crazy mixed-up drugs they're manufacturing every day. But crack cocaine predominantly is the ones that can really knock you to the knees. My life was miserable before I came here. I um, was using crack cocaine and drinking and, I don't know, um, it was just miserable, you know. I um, used to leave my kids at home with my, with my aunt and just go over to another friend's house and use and sometimes I wouldn't make it home for days. You know, and um, would spend up all my money, and was happy. So I thought when I was doing it, but you know, after everything was gone, all the money was gone, and everything, I was real miserable. You know, really miserable. Just a living hell. I cannot put into words what I have gotten in the short time I've been here. It's, it's no words can explain it. I mean, my life is so much better. And if it's, and I look at it like, if it's this good in six months, what is it going to be like if I continue? It's just going to get better and better. I start off sniffing gasoline. That's a hell of a high, because it got some cars a day and airplanes are flying. Uh, from that to glue. From that to put a needle in my arm at 10 years old. Uh, I found myself being a slave to everything that I used. You know, and right today, by me choosing, by, by, by me choosing to, to try out crack cocaine, I found myself in a bottomless pit. Um, I came here with nothing. You know, the things that I did have, I lost it or either sold it. And whatever else anybody else had that, that, that I might have could have got my hands on, I sold that too. I'm not proud of nothing I did. But today I'm a proud, um, I was proud of making accomplishments back in my life. The sense of the bridge house that gave me a, a new leaf on life. You hurt your loved ones, people that do care. You um, steal from them at the same time. The drug is giving you a sense of manipulation that you can lie your way out of any situation. At the same time, you look, you don't look bad because you know they hurt. Spend time in jail. You've been, I've been, I was spent over 12 years in penitentiary. So I thought when I come out, I'd leave all that alone. I didn't. This program does work. But you have to be willing. You have to be honest about yourself. That you are, are tired of being tired, you see. But I, I know as long as I stick to this program, everything will be all right. But that, uh, that world out there, you know what I mean? It's a hell of a misery. You can dig yourself in a hole, and before you know it, you'd be so deep till only one or two things can happen. You can go to jail or die. It's not something that's going to go away. I, my fear is that, that people have been turning their backs on it too long, and, and now the problem is so square in the face they can't run from it. We're going to have to do something. Louisiana Crackdown was underwritten in part by Energy Corporation and Louisiana Power and Light Company, Freeport McMoran, Shell Offshore Incorporated, and the Sheraton New Orleans Hotel. Another center offering refuge for adolescents is Covenant House. It's not a rehab center, but it does give kids shelter and people to talk to. Ask yourself, do the next three guys look like they ever lived on the streets? Before I came here, I was living on the streets. I was using drugs. Um, basically just existing. I wasn't living, you know. I was 
Just trying to get loaded as much as I possibly could. You know, I was eating all the garbage. You know, I, sometimes I walk for miles going through the garbage, looking around, trying, because people would give me money to eat, you know, and I would take that money, even if it was a dollar, and go try to get a piece of rock, you know, and so if I had any kind of money at all, even if it was change, I'd hold the change until I got more change and it added up to enough for me to get loaded with. But the most earth-shattering situation happened about four months ago. I got shot in my stomach and in my wrist. And when I got back out of the hospital, I didn't stop then. I stayed with my mother for six days. She let me come home. And on the sixth day out of the hospital, I walked all the way from around City Park, all the way to the project, and I got loaded. I learned to feel, I learned to, to hurt, to love, I learned to respect people. You know, they helped to make me back into a, a human being again because I was an animal. You know, and it was a painful process. Well, I was raised in a very dysfunctional family because both my parents used drugs. So I really didn't know how to live, you know, because that seemed like it was all right because everyone around me was, was getting loaded. Started about when I was 12. I really started getting, using drugs, smoking weed, snorting cocaine. I realized that it was nobody's fault that I got loaded. I got loaded because I wanted to get high. And today I just don't choose to get high. It's, it's about, like I said once before, I said, I was talking one day to a person, and today I don't have a using problem, I have a living problem. Because using drugs is not that hard. It's not that hard to stop using. But the hardest part about it is learning how to live without using, you know. So I feel everything I went through, it was meant for me to go through, you know, because I'm still here and I'm clean today. By the time I made 16, I was smoking clickums, I was popping different pills, you know, and... By the time I got to the age of 19, you know, 18, 19, and then I was introduced to cocaine. I started using cocaine, you know, and drinking a lot, you know. About a year ago, my, my parents, my mother told me that even I had to give drugs up, I stay at home. And I chose to sell drugs and thinking that I was going to make enough money to be able to have just what I wanted in life. But I got caught, and I couldn't do anything. What did you get caught for? I got caught for distribution of cocaine with the intent to distribute, carrying a concealed weapon and resisting the officer in um, February of 88. And I also got arrested um, June 25th, 1989 for possession with the intent to distribute of cocaine and resisting the officer in your life. You have to have someone that you can really talk to, you know, because that's all I really want is somebody to just listen to me. You know, stay in school, you know, read, you know. Drugs is not the answer. Don't give up. William Reed Ellswick is wanted for importing in excess of a million pounds of marijuana into the United States between 1972 and 1983. Ellswick is described as a white male six feet tall, weighing 230 pounds with brown eyes and brown hair. He is used as many as 19 different aliases, among them Muscles Billy, Peter Johnson, Billy Miller, and John Smith. To win this war on drugs, everyone has to become involved. First, each of us has to admit that there is a problem. Then we've got to make a commitment some way or another to do something. Now, that might mean becoming a volunteer, financially supporting an organization, or simply becoming a leader in your neighborhood. And Lynn, that's exactly what our next story is all about. A group of residents in the Lafitte Housing Project who were tired of being pushed around by their drug dealers and decided to do something about it. My message is to them, don't be afraid to live your life like you want to live it. Don't be afraid to fix up your place for your kids, because this place is not for you, it's for your kids. That's what, that's what it's here for. You know, they need a place where they can play and not be afraid. They need a place where they can walk the streets and not have to run from bullets. It is that kind of positive attitude that allowed a handful of residents to regain control of parts of the Lafitte project. 
Flowers and gardens and manicured backyards replace the turf where attics once roamed. If there people see your, your, your yards, your uh, driveway clean, they're not coming in here to do no drugs. They go because they go the where the dirt is. They are there where the dirt is. Any place you see that's run down, tore down, garbage everywhere, Graffiti, that's where they that's hang. Where the, the, that's where that's they where hang. Drug, uh, you know, so uh, clean up your area. A sharp eye and a willingness to become involved is also a part of the recipe for eliminating drugs. Do you know of any other project that can boast of a neighborhood watch program? Now, as for um, us not having so much crime in our section, is because we just stopped it. We called ourselves nipping it in the bud. They had cars that would park on our end, and they would walk to the next end to buy drugs. We saw a car do this one night, and we said we'd catch the next one because if he was allowed to do it, others would come behind him. And we just take down a license number, and we'd call it in, and we sweep, and they'd just look at us, sort of say, well, they see what we're trying to do, and they're sweeping around us, so they're not afraid. And they would, they'd just go on. They can do this. This is where you live at. You can take care of where you live at. You know, we have a problem, call the police. If you got to keep calling the police day in, day out, all day, call the police. That's why they're there, to, to help you, serve. to protect and serve. But the battle to clean up has had its frustrating side, too. Residents claim their efforts have been hindered by the very people that should be helping them. We have been begging from the put fences up. Housing City and Hanover said they had no money for this. Okay, we have fences now that can be erected, and housing is holding us up again. We All need, we needed we was the hardware. And their manpower. We said we'd buy, we'd buy our own hardware. Yeah. Now we're waiting on manpower. manpower. We can't do this. They won't let us just have anyone come in and erect the fences for us. They say it has to be done by hand or employees. And we've been waiting for them to erect these fences for about three months now. Yes. We have the fences, and we can't get the cooperation of them to you know, help us put them up. It must be awfully frustrating. It is. It, is. it really is. There's also one other essential ingredient to the Lafitte story. Police officer Roland Doucette. Doucette spends a lot of his off-duty time in the project. He and other officers are responsible for putting up iron bars between buildings. Now that doesn't sound like much, but it makes life tough for a drug dealer. How large this courtyard area is? They used to be back here day and night dealing drugs. It was so bad with the, with the random shootings and the muggings and things of that nature, these people could not sleep. We addressed it because as law enforcement officers, we had the problem of containing what was going on around here. And we were just chasing our, our tails, if you will. I mean, we just, we pull in this area of Taunty Court and it would come through all the openings that they had. You know, and then we constantly were bombarded with, with uh, calls from the residents in the area saying that they were, you know, they were tired of the shootings, they were tired of the muggings, they were tired of all the drug trafficking going on in this area. So we knew we had to address that. I mean, simple logic says if, if, if they're getting away from you, you got to find some way of sealing the thing off. And everywhere that we looked, we met opposition as far as getting the, uh, the defenses put up, so we decided that we would take a hands-on approach and build them ourselves. But it would have been so easy. You're a cop. It's not your job to build fences. It's not your job to work here after you get off hours. Why are you doing it? Why are you and the other guys doing it? Well, first of all, you know, you, you take you take a, an oath that you're going to protect and serve. And uh, if you're about that, then you have to do what's, what's conducive to making sure that that gets done. I mean, somebody can stand up here all day long and say, yeah, I'm, I'm for the change in things, you know. But until you look in the mirror and decide that you're going to do something yourself to make that change, then you can't expect anybody else to do anything, you know. Now, I lead by example. That's always been my, my, my motto that if I'm, going to, if I'm going to tell you you should do such and such a thing, I want to make sure that I'm in, the, I'm in the position I'm going to make sure I'm doing it myself. Joining me right now are two of the stars of that report you just saw, two key members of the Lafitte Garden and Improvement Association, Mrs. Beatrice Brown, Mrs. Elaine Reed. Beatrice, you were awfully adamant in that piece about the fact that these kinds of things can be done. I assume you're saying that other housing project residents around the city and other neighborhood residents could do some of the same things you've already started doing. Yes, they can. All they need to do is care about where they live at. Because we know that the drug addicts do not hang around clean areas. They like filth. They like graffiti all over the wall. If you get rid of that, then you get rid of the drug problem. 
Elaine, a lot of people tend to say, well, that's what our police are for. They're the ones who have to do everything. That isn't really true. The residents have got to become committed to fighting this problem themselves, don't right. they? Right. That's where you live. That's your environment. You have to make it better for yourself. You know, you can't wait for someone else to do something for you. You have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Step one is always up to number one, right? Right, right. Both of these ladies have graciously offered to make themselves available to other people in other housing projects or neighborhoods. If you'd like to get in touch with them, please call our helpline, the same line you've been seeing flashed on your screen throughout the evening. The people there will be happy to take your name, tell them you want to contact Beatrice Brown and Elaine Reed from the Lafitte Housing Project, and they'll put you in touch with them. Louisiana Crackdown was underwritten in part by Energy Corporation and Louisiana Power and Light Company, Texaco, Allstate Foundation, and the Whitney National Bank, serving Orleans, Jefferson, and St. Tammany Parishes. People in recovery will be the first to say you can't get clean by yourself. Then once sober, it helps to be with others who are in recovery too. That's just what the members of the blues band Jericho have done. Three out of the four musicians are in recovery, and the fourth, he's the warden of the Jefferson Parish Prison who likes playing music and spreading hope. for two and a half years, almost two years and seven months. The 15th of this month will be two years and seven months. My drug of choice I like, uh, was heroin. I did a lot of other drugs, and I drank a heck of a lot. And I drank and used drugs for, a number, for far better than half of my life. Drugs ruined everything I started out with. I was drinking two fifths of vodka a day. Total disgust with oneself. You know, not being able even to, to die, you know, but to live in addiction is, is harder than dying. Explain that. Well, you, there's no way out. You know, your whole being is just when you're going to score or when you just evolve into the alcohol like I did, is when's the time saver the 7-eleven gonna open up so that you can run down there stand in front of it and pay in hell enough money to get something to drink yeah i did evolve to that same goals as far as recovery and sobriety as you uh, it'd be it'd be totally impossible otherwise because there'd always be that that temptation and that and that well there's there's always the uh, the craving you know and the urge you know that never goes away it's just a day at a time you have to take it and uh, but yeah it's uh, it's necessary to be <laughs> to be with people that are in recovery for me. You know. In the music industry, there's a lot of drugs. In those days, heroin was the uh, drug that most people fool with, heroin and pot. And uh, that's when I, I thought that that would make me a good musician. You know, I saw all the top recording artists uh, using drugs, shooting up. Uh, there's one who is still living that uh, and her top recording star that lived here for a year or two, and I was his connection. I would go school for him, and I shot up with him and other members of his band. And he was my idol. He was my role model, and I wanted to be like him. And he used drugs, and I thought uh, that would help me. 
you know, that would enhance my uh, music career. So, uh, it, it didn't work. <laughs> It's got to come from the inside of you, uh, you know, I, uh, my family uh, had problems with alcoholism and I, I witnessed it growing up as a youth and uh, I know it's devastation and uh, many friends, uh, one of them in this band, uh, had a tremendous problem with uh, narcotic addiction and alcoholism and uh, it's important to help people with these problems. You just can't turn your back on them. They have to be made aware that there is uh, just hope. Don't give up. There is hope. That's why policemen like myself get involved outside of the job, spreading that word, spending time with these uh, addicts and uh, alcoholics, and uh, going into these ghettos, going into these projects. I do this just because I want to do it. It's, to me, the thing that makes me feel good. After all the insanity I've been through, I'm getting a chance to live my dream. This has been my life dream. You know? And I'm not looking for it to grow into nothing big, you know, as long as I play. You know, I'm not looking for fame or fortune. All I'm looking to do is do what I really like to do. kinds of creative ways to solve the drug problem, a key element is offering young people hope. Pat Taylor did that several years ago when he offered a free college education to a group of students. The only catch, the kids had to stay off drugs, stay out of trouble, and keep a 2.5 grade point average. We talked with four of Taylor's kids, as they're called, about how the program has helped them. They said, man, once you get out the program, bro, you'll be with us. You'll make it big. You could be, you could dress live, you could dress nice, you could have goals in your mind, you could have jewelry, nice shoes. I said, yeah, bro, but still, I'm getting education. I could get that after I get my education. What did they say? They said, oh, man, we're going to still hang with you or whatever, but, you know, we cool and everything, but won't you sell drugs with us? It'll be best for you. I said, no, I, I can't do that. I'd rather stick with the program. The program has given me hope as in so I can go to college and be the first person in my family to go to college to be a scientist. hope that I can, I have a career. So I, I want to be an electrical engineer. And this program has helped me. I've got information from this program that helped me to be successful. What about you? Has it given you any hope of something that you could have done before? Yes. It gave me a hope that I go to college now. 